everyone to the Fly Culture Podcast. My name is Pete Tigers, and I hope you've been enjoying these during lockdown and even before then as well. Um, lots of things happening for us at the moment as well, so keep an eye out on our social media channels. And if you do find us out there, that would be really cool. Um, we really appreciate the support for both the magazine and the podcast. It's been quite over overwhelming, so I've been really, really pleased with it. Thank you so much for that. Um, my guest today, I first met John Ogborn via the online magazine I used to run called Eat Sleep Fish. We fished his local stream just outside Bristol, caught a few and finished the day with some fine banana bread he'd baked. On embarking the journey with fly culture, I knew I had to try and secure his design skills to help bring the magazine to, to life. I'm pleased he agreed and he has helped make fly culture what it is today. He's also a passionate angler who lives to fish the Welsh Hins of Wales and Locks of Scotland and the lakes around Bristol, along with many trout streams too. I thought it would be fun for you to meet a member of Fly Culture who has a fascinating fishing CV. John, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks, man. I'm doing good, yeah. Yeah, I feel like I'm trapped in a little bit of a Groundhog Day scenario, but, you know, I mean, the winter can be a bit like that anyway, and, like, about this time of year, I'm just... My mind's all over Scotland, Wales. Just can't wait to get at it, you know. But um, but yeah, no, I'm doing good. Doing good. good. And we'll delve into that at some stage. But um, I guess a lot has happened since we first fished and ate that magnificent banana bread together as well, hasn't it? Oh, man, really has. Yeah, I mean, what a journey. Yeah, it's just been incredible. I mean, both in terms of fishing, but obviously with fly culture, it's just been incredible. It's just, yeah, it's been brilliant. I still remember that day really, really fondly, and I know I, I showed you some dark, dark stuff on your your stream. But it was <laughs> it, it was um, throwing streamers on a two weight was kind of interesting. But um, it was really fascinating it seeing worked. that a, a, a stream just outside a, a major city, really, that's going about doing its thing. Even had grayling in as well, and it, it, it's a fabulous little stream, isn't it? Oh, it's incredible. And I, I still, you know, when I'm there, I still have to kind of pinch myself, really. You know, that it's, if I if I do an early morning session, which I'll get into the habit, got into the habit of doing when my kids were little, so I'd be back on duty by 10. You know, I, if I left at half five or something, I'd be there in 20, 20 minutes, you know, and I'd be, I'd be fishing in half an hour. Um, and it's just lovely. And I mean, what I love about it is it's kind of unpretentious and kind of quite modest. In terms of it's, you know, you got your dog walkers. You got, particularly in, during the pandemic, when uh, before lockdown, you got kids on rope swings, kind of swimming in the deeper pools. You know, you got you regularly get poached once a year by the same people, <laughs> and um, it's, you know, there's no pretensions to it. And um, but yet it's just such a gem. I mean, it's beautiful ranunculus. You know, a, a decent mayfly hatch and. Um, you know, we've stopped stocking it, so it, we're trying to encourage the, you know, the resident wild trout population to grow. And as you say, there's there's a good head of grayling. There's some, don't, not, don't come across them so much these days, but there's some chard and some roach and occasionally the old carp will crop up. So, you know, it's a really, really lovely stream. And then the otters have come back. There's water voles. There's kingfishers. I mean, you know, within 20 minutes of my house. It's just, I can't believe it really. It's fantastic. I, I, well, all I was going to say was that that stream, as you say, has everything. And it's those unsung heroes that are the real stars in my book as well, that I kind of like those places that um, people don't know so much about. And I know we've got the Wild Trout Trust auction coming up and it's wonderful that it raises money for such a great cause. But when I look at it, I always look at those ones near the back and the little unknown streams and, and try and get on those ones because they're the ones that, for me at least, uh, I find absolutely fascinating. And, you know, that, that stream comes under that as well, I think. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And, um, I mean, when I joined it, I mean, you know, thank goodness for the internet because it, it, was, uh, it was down to about 20 members, I think. It was very much a local club, but it had been a course fishing club back through the 60s and 70s. Uh, but one of, uh, about halfway up the beats, there was a, was a big weir that was broken down 
and completely changed the nature of the of the river and it it became a you know much more suitable for trout and grayling um but the but the actual membership had sort of diminished um over the years and uh one of the one of the members of the club had built a fairly rudimentary website but actually i and a number of other people found it and uh you know within a couple of years the membership was right back up to full capacity and i think since then there's been a waiting list of sort of five or six years so um and um you know i just yeah the day i clicked on that link uh, <laughs> i'm always grateful for that you know it's uh yeah it's it's great great little river and I remember the grayling there, and I remember sitting on one grayling until I could catch it. And that's an added bonus <laughs> as well. And does that allow you to actually fish for them in the winter too? Well, it does. But to be honest with you, Pete, I'll never forget that fish, actually. I think you went through your entire fly box before you got it. It really taught me something in terms of just hanging in there and just keep putting the fly and keep changing the fly. Because I would have given up about 20 minutes before you. but. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you can fish during the winter, which I, 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 can, I tend to have like one or two trips up there during the winter. And there'll be a big kind of social element to that. It'll be just getting together with someone for a kind of cup of tea and a chat and a little bit of fishing. But I'm, I still really enjoy the close season. I'm like really Mr. Delayed Gratification. I kind of love the sense of waiting and, you know, and the snowdrops coming out and then all the little signs that we're getting near to the, the start of the trout season. I really enjoy that. And I feel a little bit like, you know, if I fish too much during the winter, I chip away at that anticipation. So I'm quite happy, really, to uh, hang up my rods and, you know, I'm being self-employed as well because I fish so much during the spring and summer. At some point, I've got to earn some money. So <laughs> I tend to get my head down in the winter and kind of make sure I can uh, afford to fish in the summer and, you know, the autumn and the spring. That's a really interesting view of not fishing during the winter and i've sort of kind of tried it and obviously we're here as well dictated by weather conditions and how big the rivers have been and we've been getting these wet winters so you missed it but it's this one's been a really interesting one not being able to fish full stop i.e not having a grading river near enough to me um has made it kind of interesting and although it's been a, a a chance to have a breather and to reset not being able to do it has made it that little bit more difficult i have to say personally that yeah. you know i've missed fishing i'm even if i fished 50 70 days over the winter i'm still as excited <laughs> come trout season um when that comes but you know we start salmon on first of march i can get close to, i can get to the river there without breaking any rules god i'm gonna fish like a maniac i'm gonna fish terribly even if the river's huge, I'll be there in some way, shape or form just to mark it. I really do yeah. miss it. I found myself, I bought some new wading boots the other day and I walked around the bedroom in my waders and wading boots just to check they fitted all over. It's ridiculous, really, isn't it? I'm old enough to know better. But isn't that, isn't that what we're, we're fishing is all about, searching for that? You know, I, I remember when I was a teenager, we had this shop in Bristol called Paradise Garage the sold George Cox creepers, you know, and I remember my buying my first pair and I was so into these shoes, you know, I almost wore them to bed, you know, I'm so excited about it. And it's that kind of Christmas feeling. And I, you know, still, it's always a, kind of like a journey to try and get that again. And fishing's like a kind of a quick access to that, isn't it? That feeling before you've got a, you head off at five in the morning on a trip or, you know, it's that, it, it's, it's all about that kind of, that, almost the boyhood feeling that excitement and um you know I was sort of thinking about key moments uh for me and my kind of fishing career if you will and some of them have been like the most simple times you know I can remember fishing literally a, a man-made culvert in a in a housing estate which had some little chublets in a little in a pipe with Jack my son when he was about five you know we just had the top section of a fly rod with a with a bit of bread on it and I that that just remains with me as one of my kind of all-time fishing highs and I think probably because it came close to that kind of excitement that you have when you're younger you know and I think we're continually searching for that and I think as well it's all the things that go with it and it's funny enough while you were saying that it made me think of fly culture in that sense that we look at that bigger 
picture of it. And I've been, I've, as I've said on here a number of times already, that I'm just not interested in tying any flies at all for some reason. I couldn't tell you why it is. I just don't. And I've been buying flies from friends and I've got some new fly boxes coming and I'm really looking forward to sorting out the fly boxes and all those little right. things that go with it getting prepared as you say for the new season and um that's part of it isn't it? it it is that bigger picture of everything isn't it well isn't it just i mean i think you know the anticipation sometimes is even better than the event or you know at least as good as i mean one of my favorite things is just going when when we've decided where we're going on our, our big trip for the year is going out and buying the map <laughs> that feels like the real first step you know and then just spreading it out and looking at all the possibilities I mean I've got a, a big map here just pinned to the picture rail of Scotland at the minute and I'm you know kind of desperately trying to get on my work but my eyes keep kind of drifting up and looking at all the places that you know could be on the agenda so I think that that sense of anticipation is just fantastic isn't it yeah definitely yeah yeah, yeah. I and I think that... with um I saw your maps on the wall in on your social media and um, yeah, that that planning aspect of it. And when you come to the planning, do you sort of and say you're, it looks and sounds very much like you're going to Scotland. Does that mean that you will drive to Scotland and fish or does it mean because I've been thinking about this a little bit now and I've talked about doing some sort of tour and do you fish somewhere en route or do you just head down and get to your destination? Oh no, for me, it's like very much about the whole trip. Definitely. I mean, one of my favorite points is just setting off in the morning with the car loaded up, picking up my buddy who lives sort of a couple of streets away and then getting on the M5. I mean, I love all of that you know, hopefully up to Penrith for about 11 for a bit of sort of brunch and a wander around John Norris, pick up a few last bits and pieces. And then uh, normally if we're going to Scotland, we'll stop off. Last year we fished the Clyde for the afternoon. It was only about three or four hours, but you know, it was just great to be there. Uh, this time I think we're going to try the Emont um, and then we'll stay off in Glasgow. And then, I mean, it's a heck of a long, we're going up to Orkney this year. So it's a big old drive up from Glasgow, but the whole trip, yeah, it's not, it's something, I mean, obviously after the event on the way home, it's not quite as exciting, but certainly on the way up is really part of it, definitely. Yeah, we'd do the same when we were going to the Devon and we'd stay um, somewhere in Yorkshire or the lakes or whatever overnight and then drive. Because like you say, once you get past Glasgow, it's still a long drive up to Banff from there. But we'd do the same, have a wander around John Norris, go in the shop across the road there, have a bit of tea and cake and everything that went with it. And that that is part of it. But like you say, the journey back is kind of interesting that your head's down and we'd do it in one go. And it's like 11 hours doing <laughs> shifts, you know, and so you'd close your eyes for a couple of hours while Emma drove and I'd do the same and, and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's different. It's funny yeah. that the, on a trip, I was just thinking about it then. Is there a stage where you start thinking, because that first day, isn't it, is just off the dial with excitement. Less, no. And then you get into a rhythm, don't you? And, you know, it might even be, and it sounds like you're the same when, when I fish with, with friends on road trips, that you have your own side of the car or whatever it is where your kit is, so you know where everything is. And you get into that nice rhythm of how things work and then it's almost sort of it goes so quickly doesn't it that it almost feels like the sands are, are, are falling through the hourglass really really quickly and then you start thinking particularly when you're there I've got the drive tomorrow or whatever it is and I desperately try to eat every last second out of the fishing are you similar in that sense of the rhythm of it and how how the the, the trip plays out Absolutely, but I think probably as much out of necessity as anything else, because at my well, at our age, I don't know if you're anything like me, but unless I've got a routine, particularly with getting ready for a fishing trip, I'll forget something, you know. And if you're on a lock all day and relying on an electric motor, if you forget to charge the motor, that should, you know, that that's that's going to cause a big problem the next day. So there's definitely a rhythm. But you know, one of the nicest moments of the day is when you get in. You know, if you're fishing up in Scotland, you can be fishing till a couple of
couple of years ago on South Yes, we were there on fishing at midnight. It was incredible. It's like, again, that was just a real highlight. Um, catching fish too at midnight. But uh, you know, that moment when you come in about nine o'clock, someone's turn to cook the dinner, crack open a beer and all that kind of stuff. And there, like you say, there was a natural rhythm to the trip, which is just fantastic. You know, it's amazing. And I think what we've done to kind of counteract that, um, that uh, the thought of the looming journey back is we, we put Malam Tarn in as a kind of stop off to bring us down it's our kind of methadone <laughs> to, get, to get us to get us back to normal life and actually i mean some of the best fishing has been in uh, mallet anyway so um yeah it's just and then you get into your uh get into your office when you're back at work and you can if you've been in a boat for a week drifting on those locks you can still feel the boat moving it's incredible you know it's like, like a lovely little reminder of what's just been so yeah no definitely yeah there's definitely a rhythm and um yeah and a routine to it it was interesting what you're saying about the the trip and catching fish at midnight and i think those ones are probably past me now but i was thinking about my buddy ray who um when you were talking about it who i've been on around the world with really and when we were younger we went to new zealand and we'd flown he's from california i'm sure he'd be listening to this so we flew via los angeles and he phoned a few friends and then we had to fly from there down to to new zealand and we'd barely had any sleep we picked up the hire car the people at the bed and breakfast it was a farmhouse bed and breakfast weren't there so we just threw our bags in their driveway left them got into our, our fishing stuff and hit the river straight away and then it reminded me of our last trip we went to spain and we went for trout but we discovered barbel in the rivers and that was it but it was a much more sedate trip as we've got a little bit older and even a sort of well we thought well they should come on again about six should we have a siesta about four o'clock and we did that and then we'd sort of bleary eyed come out at six and fish through and even that was really cool and then we'd fish late and we were in catalonia and we'd have rabbit or whatever it was for the, you know it was just fantastic oh. the whole thing although the fishing hours were probably a little less than we've done in the past enjoyment levels were equally as high and it it's funny how I, and i talk a lot about it on these podcasts that how the rhythm of these things changes as you get older as well i i guess you find that too to a degree definitely and, and in a way i've sort of found that a bit of a relief you know when i first started fly fishing i was i mean i didn't come to it till quite late i was about 24 25 uh, albeit i think the kind of gene had been there sort of dormant um but uh i was completely obsessed you know i was just every waking moment you know my my best mate always jokes about me just disappearing for hours on when i'm in the bathroom with the trout and salmon <laughs> you know just just sort of like i i was absolutely obsessed by it and and actually albeit it was great because it was exciting um it's nice to get a bit of balance back and actually that fills through to the day's fishing. You know, you know that if you stay out, you can do one midnight, but if you do three in a row, you're not going to enjoy the last two days. So actually, and do you know what? You don't catch any less fish, you know, if you enjoy your breakfast and stop and have a lunch. And you you, very, you only gain having that tight social time. You, you definitely don't catch any less fish because you approach it in a more calm. And, you know, I remember when I first started fishing, trying to get out of the car without even taking my safety belt off because I was so <laughs> eager to get on the river. <laughs> oh. Whereas now, you know, I'd much prefer just to stop and have a cup of tea and just have a little bit of think about what I'm doing when I get on the riverbank, just soaking it up, you know, such a privilege to be able to do it. Um, and particularly to be able to do it with friends. Do you know what I mean? It's it, you, you want to just sort of savor that and enjoy it uh, rather than sort of running around like a headless chicken. So definitely that's one of the, the good things about getting older i think it's not as intense but it's still very rich the enjoyment so yeah that's no, great yeah fantastic no I, I love every aspect of it i still shake with excitement when i go fishing and <laughs> if i do lose that then i'm in trouble i don't know i, I 
doesn't feel any time soon like it's going anywhere. So that's really cool from that point of view. But um, talking about trips and your trip to Scotland, that sort of, and we touched on my falling out of love with fly tying at the moment. Does that mean you prepare? That's part of that journey starting, isn't it? By tying flies for your trip. And do you do that? Are you sort of an avid fly dresser, tire that you've been doing loads over this lockdown period um not really i mean i do enjoy um tying flies but not really for the sake of it um and um i will be tying flies for this trip rather than i i like to kind of make sure i've got what i need but um i think i did a trip to Quran about probably about 10 years ago now where <laughs> When I was at the kind of peak of my enthusiasm where I tied about 300 flies before I went, you know, I've still got 290 of them. Um, and, you know, I just, they've just sat there, a lot of them. Um, so it's a kind of bit more needs must. And I've definitely got a limit. You know, if I, I can't tie more than a dozen flies in a sitting, I just can't. I just get re- restless and have to do something else. So um, I, I enjoy tying my own, but I, I wouldn't do it for its own sake. Yeah. And is that's about six more than I'd tie when I sat down. But and I, I put something out on my social media yesterday about, or the day before, I can't remember now. About I'd got some flies from a friend, and somebody had posted that they tied six. That was their first task of the day, and yeah. I said, "Wow, they all look the same." Because mine sort of take a route of their own, and so there might be three. And then the sort of it goes off a little bit and there might be a subtle change. Are you regimented six or 12 that will look identical or do you sort of go down a Darwinian route a little bit and let them go how they want to go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would I would describe my um, fly tying as very much impressionistic. Yeah, I mean, my my mate Pete, who I am, um, another Pete, who I do these trips with is, I mean, his are just absolutely perfect you know but he's much more uh his personality is more like that he's he's the guy who'll keep the the schedule for the trip written down he's very flexible we'll go off schedule but we always know there's something to come back to do you know what i mean so he's very organized like that which we make quite a good quite a good pairing because i'm probably the one who said come on let's go to wherever in the first place do you know what i mean and then he'll actually make it happen Uh, and his fly tying is is kind of really very very kind of clean and crisp and I mean very very effective flies um whereas mine's a little bit more kind of yeah like you say <laughs> as the spirit takes me kind of thing yeah yeah mine I think that's a hangover from guide flies and there's you know a hatch that was working and that's the downside I guess if you only tie three that you want and then three other ones and there's a chance a bunch of those aren't going to work within that permutation so yeah, I don't yeah. know if that's something to do with that's it, good. but yeah, impressionistic <laughs> is is fine by me. And I know you're equally at home, and you've been talking about the locks. I guess you're fishing. Are you are you going to fish the? Are there rivers that you're going to fish when you go up there as well? Um, I don't, no, I don't think so because my my local fishing is river fishing. Really, we've got the Bristol waters, and I tend to go up to the tanks maybe once or twice a year. Maybe fish fish Blagden once a year. Um, but I do most of my river fishing around here. So I I love, I find lo- locks in wild places intoxicating. There's something about the, you know, the heather and the gorse and the rock and where the water meets the, the, the land. And I, it's something about drifting onto a shore, which is just incredible. So, and I can't do that near to where I live. So um, I like to spend as much time and if I'm in somewhere like that doing that so I don't tend to fish the rivers as much but we will like I said we'll probably take in a river on the way up cool that's interesting I guess from your point of view you're the dream boat partner being left-handed as well <laughs> well I would be apart from my my main boat partner is also left-handed <laughs> ironically <laughs> but over the years I mean I'll, I'll kind of catching each other has kind of dropped over the years so now we're most of the time we're okay and um i mean i'm not considering how long i've been fishing i'm a pretty crap caster really but actually drifting from a boat is about as easy as it gets because you've got the wind behind you and you 
basically just dropping the flies in front of you so um and then stripping them like mad so um yeah we tend to do all right and we've been in some awful boats over the years you know some boats are almost kind of round <laughs> um so we've kind of had to be fairly versatile yeah I was thinking about the left-handed thing as well, and then it, it made me think, obviously, you know, you being a, a designer and, and working with us with, with Fly Culture as our designer and our artistic director, Perry, as well, is left-handed. Is there something, do you subscribe to this thing about the left side or is it the right side that makes you right left-handed that, that makes, it ties with an artistic side of your brain to be left-handed? Um, well, you hear that, don't you? My daughter, Holly, is also left-handed and she's like, I mean, super creative. You know, she's a really properly good artist. And, um, but yeah, Pete, I mean, I'm not saying he's not artistic, but Pete, the guy I fish with, who's left-handed, is very much an administrator, organised and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think there's probably some truth in it, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Yeah, it's, uh, it just made me think about it. Then I suddenly thought, right, you're left, and then it made me think of Perry and everything else. And I wondered if there, yeah, yeah. there might be something in that. But um, what I wanted to come on was the the magazine, and you know, um, I was absolutely thrilled to knew the first phone call I made when I was thinking about bringing the magazine. And um, as a someone who is a designer, was it an interesting project for you? And also fun, I guess, to combine your passions. Oh, look, Pete, I mean, it's the dream job, isn't it? I mean, it's just bringing, I mean, I love my work. Um, I'm very privileged to have been able to, you know, do it for 30 years, working for myself. And, uh, you know, I, I, I never get that kind of Monday, you know, Monday morning, Sunday night feeling. I'm, I'm always up for it. Um, so being able to kind of, bring the design and the, the fly fishing together was just fantastic. I mean, I must admit, I was a little bit nervous <laughs> because my audience would be basically a lot of my mates and, you know, it would all be out there. So, but I'm, I'm so glad I sort of said yes and, um, and, and went with it because I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been great. I mean, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm pleased you said yes as well. So um, thank you for that. And, when we first spoke about bringing a magazine, how does your process go and you'd agree to, to come on board? Do the cogs immediately start turning for you or do you like to look at the content and work from, from there so you see it as is and then say, right, okay, this is how it'll be? Do you, do you have an idea or does it remain flexible and, and fluid? Well, no, I mean, there is a method to putting fly culture together. But that's something that we kind of worked out early on. We looked at other publications that were not necessarily about fly fishing or fishing, but, um, you know, kind of gold standard publications that were doing a similar thing, I guess, but in other areas, which was treating the content like it was something really precious, you know, which it is. Um, and there's there was already, you know, everybody knows there's plenty of fishing magazines out that do the kind of normal magazine format really well um so there was no point really trying to go after that um because it's already been done but within fly fishing i think there was something there was some space for something more considered uh i mean i always i, I always think of fly culture as a journal rather than a magazine um you know it's a collection of essays really and, and bits of artwork and um you know i just saw my job and i still see my job now uh, as as just presenting that as simply as I possibly can without getting in the way um, because the content's great you know um, and yeah it's just delivering that content in a way that people are going to be able to get to it and read it and just enjoy it and touch it with the lovely paper um, so yeah that hasn't changed um, yeah and we decided sort of on that, as you alluded to, a clean, unfussy look. As a designer, though, does that actually make it more, that process more difficult in the sense of, and I know a word and we talk all the time, obviously, that, you know, you, you use the word overworking 
something and is that something that that you think about quite often when when that process begins partly is i think i'm partly sort of trying to play to my strengths because uh you know i've always been a kind of minimal designer so you know i'll kind of my, my me and my partner our ethos has always been what's what's the least amount of marks we can make to convey the message in the strongest possible way so that's always been the way we've approached it so i you know to be honest with you i wouldn't probably be very successful at doing something that, that really swanky and flash and glossy i think the term is uh i could only bring to it my my style you know so um and fortunately i feel like it's the it's the right fit so it would be about keeping keeping it kind of pretty minimal and clean and then um you know the bits that you do drop in then have a kind of precious quality to them so um you know that that that's how it started and that's that's kind of how i approach design so it makes sense that i did that with fly culture too works really really well and um that sort of you know i guess the vision was similarly shared from that point of view that having something um that was clean and and let as you rightly say the articles and the photography speak for themselves and um you know i remember some of the meetings we had where we looked at how to bring the magazine and the paper and having matte or gloss or whatever it may be and they were fascinating parts of it and it's it was a really interesting insight to learn how you look at things and i've learned a lot about that and for the listeners it's a it's a really from certainly from my standpoint a great relationship that i know i can speak to you about anything and you'll tell me straight and that's what i really enjoy about that aspect of it and it is you know how so our listeners i guess get an uh, insight into it is that we put the the magazine together and emma and i will look at articles and brett as well we'll look at that we'll look at photography and we'll ensure that we have those pages the hundred pages as we always do filled in the rhythm of the magazine is really important to me as well and i know to yourself how it actually reads so how the articles um go um through basically and then when that's done i send that to john so i sort of placed stuff and then that's when you sort of weave your magic and um that that must be a really i, I look forward to delivering and packaging it to you yeah. i hope you similarly <laughs> look forward to receiving it because i guess you're seeing it in its very very rawest form aren't you yeah it reminds me of the first time you did that Peggy, on <laughs> issue one you said oh do you mind just having a look at this what could it what is it can you give us a few tips and i was like okay looks like i'm going to get involved in this so that was that was great but yeah i still get that buzz now when it arrives it's brilliant and um just you know it's it's like getting the magazine delivered i guess you get to see what's going to be in it you know see what photographs there are you see the potential then i skim read to see okay what are going to be the pull quotes that i bring out where where can i do an illustration you know and i'm in my mind i sort of building it and bringing it all together and uh uh yeah it's very exciting yeah it's really good but i'm kind of right in that process at the minute with uh spring 2021 so yeah that's yeah. great that one it's funny how this works isn't it and somebody once asked me i was a guest somewhere or other and somebody said what have you got and i thought i couldn't remember because i was sort of one or in this case i'm working on summer so mm. i'm halfway through summer at the moment and sort of chasing articles there and thinking, right, does this work? Does that work? And it's really hard. And then when you send the finished design piece back to me, then I sit down and read it again. And it's really yeah. fun. And I, you know, I'll say to Emma, yeah, he's pulled it off again. And it's lovely when you <laughs> see the finished thing, because it's exciting then. And then, like you say, you get the double hit. And that's always, I don't know how you feel about it, that when it turns up, you know, we physically unload it from the lorry, Emma and I. We put all the, the labels on and there's a lot. And we do all of those. We hand pack every single one of them. 
And then I sit down and I have a quick flick through and send you a text and say, yep, it's looking great, looking absolutely fantastic. But then there's that very slight nervous thing where it goes out with people and you're waiting to hear how people have um, seen it and what they make of it. And do you feel similarly in that when it's it's hitting the, 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 the readership? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, and, and all the more so because it's fly culture. I mean, you know, as a designer, you're you're constantly kind of exposing something, aren't you, in a way that your creativity and uh, opening yourself up to, you know, people to kind of make a judgment on it. It's just part of the job. Um, and, you know, you've put your heart and soul into bringing that content together over the past few weeks, months. Do you know what I mean? It's been kind of your waking and sleeping day that's been you know at the forefront of your mind so obviously yeah you've you know there, there's a nervousness about how it'll be received and similarly with with um with the design but i think because of the approach i take is uh you know i've got a i've got a method um really the it's again it's mostly about the content you know there, there's little flourishes and bits and pieces that i pop in but which I really hope people enjoy, but it's it's about okay. Have I have I made a good job at actually presenting this content in a, a way that um, kind of honours the person who took the photo or wrote it? And I think that's the kind of that's the, that's the key thing. And there's nice challenges in that. I mean, obviously, if you get some photography that comes in that's absolutely fantastic off the blog, and it's just a case of dropping it in and you know working the type around it. But then sometimes you're because of the culture, fly culture, you, you you're giving new guys and, and women a go at writing an article and they may supply their own photographs. They're not professional photographers. It might be great pics, but you have to work a little bit harder with 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 the design and with maybe with in Photoshop just to really bring out the best in some of those pictures and show them in a way that really, really, uh, you know, makes them look at their best. So. I enjoy that challenge as well, you know, to try and, yeah, to try and bring that together. And I, it felt to me as though we found our identity pretty early on, and I'm proud that we've trodden our own path ever since. Does that feel that way to you as somebody who's micro looking at the design process and the identity of the magazine? Has, has it felt that way to you? Yeah, I think so. I think it has. I mean, you know, in a way, what I I don't normally say this because if I go do a presentation of, say, you know, if I'm designing a new branding or something, I often say to Liz, you know, well, I, I'm really pleased with what I'm showing. And if they don't like it, well, that, you know, it's a shame. But actually, as long as I feel like I've done the best I can and I'm happy with it. But I think with fly culture, uh, ultimately, because it's a commercial product and people are paying money for it, uh, it is important that people really like it. So, um, you know, I, 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 that is an important response for me. I, I want people to like it um, and continue to want to pick it up, you know. Yeah. It's been interesting that you said a few moments ago about, you know, we looked really more so at the independent publishing market space as it were and you know people will say um publications magazines whatever they may be are are falling it's a shrinking marketplace but we in our own small little way seem to have bucked that have you been surprised how that has happened and um how we've was you know i guess people may have felt early on well this is going to be a a one or two hit wonder and, you know, we're coming up three years soon. Have you been pleasantly surprised how it's played out and the feedback that you've had from people that you've met along the way? Uh, I'd say yes and no. I mean, you know, with you with you in the driving seat, <laughs> it's going to get 100 percent energy. So if anything's going to succeed, then, you know, it, it's got a really good fighting chance. Um, I would say. Um, I think with fly fishing, I mean, I suppose you could say the same with maybe cycling or something, but it's a very kind of aesthetic pastime. You know, it's got its own aesthetic and it's quite a beautiful thing. Uh, you know, whether that's obviously the fish, <laughs> a gorgeous wild brown trout or, a, you know, like a Hampshire Avon Springer or, 
you know, a, a sea trout from an Irish loch. I mean, they're just exquisite creatures and you only really catch them in beautiful places. So most fly fishermen have got a kind of fairly finely tuned aesthetic and appreciation of, of, of that. Um, so I think uh, to be able to try and tap into that somehow, I mean, I'm not comparing like the design of fly culture with those beautiful things, but what I'm trying to say is to be able to offer those things up, uh, you know, you, you've got a willing audience already. And, um, you know, we're going, we, I think we're tapping into that aesthetic um, in terms of, you know, the places that we love, love to go and, and the little details that we notice. I think it's about that, you know, whether it's that time with your friends or, you know, a particular beer that you've enjoyed or whatever it is. Uh, and I think that the format of fly culture really, really suits that. Uh, that sort of slower stopping to take time to notice and observe and enjoy. Um, so, and there's, you know, because we're fly fishermen, I think we're fairly like-minded. We enjoy those things. Um, and therefore I'm not entirely surprised. Um, I don't think I've said to you before, it's, you know, it's always only going to have probably a limited market, but I think we've, we've found it and, you know, and you're making a good job of kind of growing it. It's really interesting the parallels you draw about the beauty of the fish. And it makes me think, you know, that's such a key thing, having someone designing the magazine who feels the same way you do about fishing. And I guess you could look at it a couple of ways, couldn't you? You could have somebody designing something that doesn't really know it, yet when somebody's heart's invested in it, I think that probably comes through too. And listening to you, you know, about the beauty of wild brown trout, salmon, whatever it may be, that makes that process more complete to me as somebody listening to that as well. Yeah, well, I definitely feel that, you know, I, 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 when I'm putting things on the page, it's not just a technical exercise. You know, it's like, you know, particularly if there are articles to, re to that relate to kind of where my passions are. Um, then, uh, you know, we've had some on South Yurst and we had one in Shetland recently. And, um, you know, I, I'm just, I, I, well, I do with all the articles, but particularly I want to be able to communicate what I'm feeling, you know, with that. Um, and there's a tension there because part of me is kind of, I can't get it out quick enough. But the other part of me is like, whoa, you know, remember, we're going to keep this kind of, minimal and cool and just let the pictures do the speaking and the writing do the speaking so i'm kind of continually having this fight with myself just to kind of just pair back and yeah but but i'm always i feel passionate about what i'm what i'm laying out definitely yeah yeah i think that comes across in 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 by the truckload and it sort of reminded me while you were saying that, that there was one of the pieces we had and you got up at silly o'clock in the morning to tie i think it was a band shrimp or something like that so that you could photograph it and put it in with an article on salmon fishing i think it was band shrimp yeah it? yeah it was yeah yeah well you see a gap and then once you've you've seen that gap you know you've got to fill it so and, and what's been really great i mean when i started off um i did my degree on a graphic design course so i went there as an illustrator you know because at school the only thing i was really good at was sitting down drawing a crushed coke can and a knackered converse all star you know like you did <laughs> in o level art um and so i went off to uni thinking i was gonna be an illustrator i had a bit of a kind of road to damascus experience then um, with graphic design but it's this is the first time really in 30 35 years that um i've had the chance to do some illustration again and i absolutely love it so and that that's born out of okay there's a there's a nice little gap there there's a nice part of this story that could be illustrated, you know, with an object or a little collection of objects or whatever. And um, yeah, it's probably my favorite bit. Once I've got the whole magazine laid out is going in and just, as I call it with you, tuning it up and just do making and dropping in the little illustrations. And it's brilliant. Yeah. I really, really love that bit. I still think one of my favorites is a piece that accompanied Chad's, um, gamblers of la tienda and you did a beer bottle and drew a beer bottle top with fly culture on it and that was really oh, yeah. super cool yeah yeah 
actually no, i well it was a little bit of photoshop work rather than the drawing but yeah but yeah it's nice you know if you can find one object that sort of draws you in to read the the rest of the you know the writing or, or maybe helps with that a bit like a pull quote does you know catches your attention then you know that but then again it's again not over egging that do you know what i mean it's picking and choosing that and um yeah so yeah, that's what i aim to do anyway cool what's well, been really nice been... in the in 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 the in the last um fly culture has been able to commission i mean we have loads of really good illustrators anyway but um danny jenkins who's an illustrator here in bristol i've always loved his work and been able to get him to well actually he he asked to do some work for us because um he'd seen fly culture and that was a real privilege because he's great so yeah it was great to be able to include some of his work yeah yeah no that was fantastic that really accompanied um tim's mullet piece fantastically so yeah it's great and that's been you know you keep the faith with everything don't you and then like you say you have people that you admire i'm having articles come in from people around the world that i'm thinking wow that's you know really impressive stuff and and for them to want to be involved with what we're doing is deeply humbling um and but also makes you feel perhaps you may be doing something along the right lines which is really pleasing but let's move on a little bit now and talk uh, i was thinking about when you talked about your fishing and you said you came to fly fishing a little bit later what was the story behind that? You said your mid twenties. How did that happen? And you said you had a dormant gene. How did that happen? <laughs> well, I, d I don't know if this happened for you, Pete, but I've, a few of my friends who fish had had a, an experience in their childhood where they had seen a fish in a river somewhere, and something had clicked. You know, for me, it was um, it was on the uh, it was on the Devon Avon, I think, in in Dartmoor. And I was on a family holiday and I looked into a culvert and there was a brown trout. I'm not even sure I knew it was a brown trout, but uh, just holding in the current. And it was just magical. I don't know, something happened. Um, and uh, no fisher, no anglers in the, in the family at all. So I didn't really have anyone to kind of help steer me to explore that. So it was kind of at a few false starts with course fishing, but it kind of sat dormant. And, you know, I was in Bristol, so it was much more about going out to the pub and going to gigs and that kind of thing. Um, so it kind of sat dormant till I met a mate of mine, Pete, found out that he um, had grown up fly fishing. I mean, where he lived in Hexham, you know, that's what all the kids did. They went fly fishing on the time. You know, they strapped their rods to their, their uh, crossbars and their bikes and they went off and literally... He went off with his mate, cycled over to the border-esque and went sea trout fishing at night, you know, with his rod strapped to his bike. So he grew up there. I found out that he did this and basically pestered him <laughs> till he took me up to the tanks and taught me to uh, taught me to fly fish and then subsequently taught me to tie flies as well. So that's how it that's how it got going. Yeah. But I was completely green. I didn't have a clue, but I was just I immediately knew this is this is my thing, you know. And it bit uh, yeah. and it bit really deep, and um, the rest, I guess, is history. Do you have a a favourite? Uh, you say you plan your road trips and you go to a lot of places. Do you have that one place that you thought, yeah, this is the one? You know, I could. Do you, do you have one that sort of sticks in your your mind? Uh, yeah, well. The thing that first comes to mind is the East Lynn. Well, I've been talking about fishing flins and um, and locks, but actually that was that was early on in my kind of fishing career. I discovered the Lynn. You know, you could go and fish there for three. One of the great things about it, being an adult is or privileged adult is having a car <laughs> and enough money to be able to get yourself somewhere like Lynmouth, buy a ticket and go fishing for a day. I just couldn't quite believe it, you know. And it's, I mean, the Lynn's just an incredible river. You know, um, and I don't know if it's maybe it's just in Devon, but it's almost in Somerset. It's so near to where I live. that um, It just seems like another world. It's like the Rockies or something. And um, the first time I went there, I was just tackling up uh, at the little car park above um, Velocots and the overflow pool. And uh, this local came up, walked up the steps there 
with a, a grills that must have been about five or six pounds and slapped it down on the roof of his Renault Clio van. And it was so fresh that this may just be my memory, but I seem to remember it not even kind of relaxing to fit the shape of the roof. It just sat there like a solid kind of seesaw bar of silver with a bluish sheen across it. And um, it, that just sealed it i mean it was just like that that place is magical and i i've uh, you know i've even got it in my world that my ashes will be scattered at waters me just because i i just love it there you know it's brilliant and the fishing's just great just re always just fantastic to be there so yeah in fact i caught my first sea trout there uh off three weeks after after holly was born i booked <laughs> i bought book myrtleberry which is a house about halfway down the, the east lynn i think i put this in that piece that i wrote but um yeah liz has never never quite forgiven me for that three week old <laughs> baby in a house with a generator for electricity but it did have the best sea trout pool on the river literally in the back garden so i caught my first sea trout there with holly in a kind of cradle on my front yeah so that was like another really kind of special memory Awesome. Yeah. awesome it's Don't funny you say, say about your things. ashes it's funny you say about your ashes going that waters me i'm going to go on the tour i'm just only hoping i get cremated <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it all goes back into the system doesn't it pete yeah eventually yeah <laughs> biodegradable and so, yeah <laughs> and so sea trout as well and you know we we were talking off mic and i feel like i've known you for absolutely ages and you said we first actually made contact via a forum and you were asking about sea trout and we'd got chatting there that and you mentioned them there is that sort of a a fish that's always remained i get the sense it is one that's remained special to you i yeah i think probably um probably less so now than it was in the past i mean you can't do sea trout fishing in a half-hearted way i mean it's like in for a pound in for a penny in for a pound and uh you know ironically it was the years when i was getting least sleep <laughs> that i chose the part of the sport which would give me even less sleep because uh, i needed to be back for kind of taking jack to football on a saturday morning uh and uh, you know i spent the best part of 10 years driving back and forth to christchurch to fish the clay pool you know, two and a quarter hours each way for about two hours fishing every Friday night. And, um, but, but yeah, you know, you could go four or five trips without a fish, but when you got one, I mean, it's just the most amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, in the dark and it's incredible. So I did about 10 years there and then discovered the ax, um, down in Devon and fished there probably for another sort of, probably another 10 years there actually maybe maybe slightly less um but yeah in both cases stuff happened um to the fisheries that kind of made it not quite worth <laughs> the lack of sleep um for, unfortunately the axe has really suffered with um farming runoff and you know issues like that um so uh the catches were going down but um on on its day it was a fantastic sea trout fishery yeah really good so now I, my, my sea trout fishing is limited to fishing on locks where there might be sea trout or I fish every year. I'll fish the um, bridge pool in Christchurch from the uh, pump. You know, saw that on Mortimer White House um, a little while back, but I'll fish from the pump. But my, my favorite bit is getting into the water and then fishing down the run in the daylight with the tide running off and just down and across with some nymphs and wets. Just fantastic fun. I love that. And that's that gets me shaking definitely yeah yeah, yeah. it's what's it's funny jumping all day yeah lovely I, I think i've been spoiled that my friend ray who i mentioned earlier lives in denmark and i just love fishing in the sea for sea trout i love mm. fishing the, um you know the glacial lakes for them and it's just it's freezing cold it's almost akin to steelheading in that sense that you're fishing yeah. in freezing cold conditions. I usually go over November. I have been over earlier in the year as well, um, but it's usually not, and it is literally Baltic. And um, I, it sport me, I have to say, and I really, really enjoy it. And it's kind of like bass or mullet fishing, or more so bass fishing, but you're catching sea trout as a result. And 
that makes it deeply interesting to me. And yeah, I, I'm looking forward to when we can can do that again very much so. But um, you touched yeah. on the acts there and the conservation issues that that's faced. And do you think anglers are starting to make a little bit more noise about these issues now? And be it social media that's allowing them to do that or other means too. Do you, do you sense there is that starting to happen in, in, in fishing? Oh, without a doubt, yeah. I mean, we've seen it uh, in our own club. Um, you know, we've got the Wild Trout Trust in to sort of do a river survey. And uh, since that, you know, there's been a continual kind of referencing to, you know, large wooded debris and, you know, how can we scour the gravels? And, you know, we, we when I joined the club, we were stocking fish, which would pretty much be taken out the next weekend by poachers. It was a waste of time. But... Um, we, we now, you know, are very much focused on getting the environment as best as it can be for the trout and the grayling to reproduce and be self-sustaining and we're catching release. Um, so, uh, and I think, yeah, it does definitely feel like it's going that way. And, uh, you know, and there's less kind of adversity between um, the different river users as well. You know, I think we, we've seen as anglers that, uh, you know, it can be a pain if you get canoers come through your beat that you're fishing but they're enjoying the river as well and you know it's much better that you know we we put up with that inconvenience in a way because they're having to put up with us and join forces against the real dangers you know uh of pollution and farm runoff and um you know overflow from sewage works and, and it's great to see wild swimming as well you know and i think if we can all get on uh and uh, we'll be much stronger together in terms of fighting these things so yeah, no, I, it's difficult to tell on social media, really, isn't it? I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking in terms of fly fishing generally, you kind of follow who you follow. So you get a very, you see it with politics, don't you? You kind of get the messages that you you already believe in. But you kind of get that little bit of fly fishing as well because of who you follow. And you think it's a really dynamic young sport, you know. <laughs> but actually, you kind of rank and file season ticket holders at the tanks of Blagden. Um, you wonder how they're, they're faring out there, whether they're, they're still there in the numbers. Well, I, I don't think they are in Bristol Waters because they're, they're, they're currently looking for someone else to take the fishing on. So you wonder what the reality is on the ground. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm not sure social media gives you the whole picture. But I lo- I'd hope so. Certainly the tide seems to be turning a little bit with salmon farms. Um, and there's been some notable victories recently in terms of licenses not being granted and things so you really hope so i mean it's such low hanging fruit isn't it you know to fit to fix the kind of runoff issue come on just leave a margin around the field you know it's it's not rocket science just don't you know spread slurry before it's going to rain <laughs> plow your field in the right direction i mean i'm not a farmer but come on surely we can do those things and prevent these massive kill-offs of fish and rivers like the Towie and the Tyvee and um, I just think, you know, it, it feels like so much to do with the environment is out beyond of our control, whereas those things, they feel like they're reachable and, and anglers really should be at the forefront of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely feels to me as though that noise has turned up a little bit more and long may that continue. And, and yeah, I hope that does. And and this process continues to grow and the movement continues to grow. Uh, you mentioned about when you stayed on the Lynn and Holly had just been born um, and Liz was down there with you, your wife. And I, well, you mentioned to me that she's started to become fly fishing curious as well, which is, <laughs> are you super pleased? Are you super enjoyed those days you've had with her? Yeah, do you know, I really am. Yeah. I mean, she's, yeah, I and mean, she's great company for a start. And um, it, it's, it's. I, I guess there's an element of, uh, I mean, she's she's quite a kind of strong spirit as Liz, but I think there may be an element of, you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> so I think, you know, our kids are both left home now and, um, you know, we it's nice to be able to do stuff together. And I think she, she quite fancied giving fly fishing a go. And then I took her, again, I wrote about it in Fly Culture, took her up to Craigannon, because so I'd had a day with Pete there, and I, I mean, it's just stunning. I mean, it's just the most beautiful place, full of wild brown trout, which are actually quite willing. And I thought, okay, well, if I get her there, this will this will really seal seal the deal because it's so beautiful and 
there's a good chance she'll catch something and she did caught half a dozen fish and um yeah and then she wanted to go again so uh, and then so she booked herself some um, casting lessons with dave wiltshire and um i mean i'm i'm the kind of artistic one in the partnership she's definitely the sporty one I mean, I'm still a crap caster after years, I said before, but she was into the backing after a couple of hours of tuition. You know, she wow. was putting out whole fly lines. So she's so um, I think there's there's a lot of promise there. So, um, yeah, I kitted her up for Christmas and got her own gear. And yeah, so we're looking forward to we've got a boat booked in April on Wimbledon. Um, I'm very much looking forward to kind of kicking things off down there. That'd be really good. Yeah. Nice. Fantastic. That sounds a dream combination and as someone who fishes with their wife too that i absolutely love it i think it's great fun and you know i can see both angles of it um but i think i'd rather have a partner that fished than didn't and you may have asked me that 15 years ago and i may have said well it's actually good to have interests that are sometimes different but now like you say i think with our daughter not being at home it you grow closer and and i think for me you know that those i'm she's looking forward to the first of march as much as i am and yeah we'll be down there giving it a really really good go so describe to me what would your perfect day on the water be oh golly uh i think okay I'm going to give you a couple. <laughs> yeah, so I, what I've been doing a lot recently is going up into the Welsh Lins with a, with a bivy bag and, um, and just while camping basically. Um, and then just working my way around a few Lins up there, Tyvee pools or up on um, Barmouth. There are a couple of lakes right up in the, up in the mountains. So yeah, it'd be something that involved more than just fishing. So, you know, like a physical element of getting there, a bit of a survival element, you know, with the, with the baby bag and kind of cooking up and, um, and then, you know, the fishing's sort of the icing on the cake really. So I think a day up in a, a kind of upland Welsh Lynn would be fantastic. I'd love that. A bit of wild camping either end of it. Uh, or, you know, just being, we're going up to Orkney, God willing in uh, at the beginning of June, and we'll be coming back via a Sint. Um, and, you know, fishing one of those with, with a, well, either up in Orkney, but the landscape and the scent, I guess, is, uh, you know, pretty dramatic. So drifting, you know, with a backdrop of, uh, is it Solvian, the mountain up there? And, you know, with a mayfly hatch going on. I mean, that that's going to be pretty special. But, you know, we did Koran for years in Ireland and you're, you're drifting, drifting, you know, 500 yards from the sea, 500 yards of river away from the sea drifting into the rocks at the east end with uh um with um uh, mcgillicuddy's reeks ahead of you you know the mountains and you know church island with the old ancient derelict church to your left and i mean across the the shore of, of, of church island for sea trout that's probably yeah that, that's where it peaks i think for me yeah nice. that's fantastic <laughs> nice having spoken to stuart about a sin there it just sounds like fishing heaven, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I hope so. The only thing I'm slightly nervous about are the are the midges, obviously. Yeah, but um, we hopefully will be okay because it's a bit early on. Maybe more of a, a risk of snow than midges, but um, we're we're um, yeah. Well, the heck, let's give it a go. Got midge nets. Yeah, got got some uh, midge repellent, so definitely give it a go. Nice nice so where would if you could go anywhere is there somewhere that is an itch you're desperate to you know bucket list destination is there somewhere you would really love to visit to say to cast a fly at something or other somewhere where where do you think that would be choppy i think i you know watching uh, Liz kind of go through a phase now where she's working out what the next stage of her career is. And she's really kind of, kind of quite ambitious and focused and she's getting a little bit of coaching and that kind of, thing. and I've just, got, <laughs> I, I do fly culture and I've got my clients and I'm quite happy kind of almost bundle, bundling along. It's just, you know, life's pretty good. So my, my fishing's fairly similar. You know, I, I mean, if I went to New Zealand, great, I'd love to fish there. Or if I went to Russia, right. But I get so much pleasure out of going, you know, over the Severn Bridge 
and up into the Black Mountains or the Cambrians, um, it, I, I don't have a, a massive desire to kind of travel, or it's particularly now we're flying, you know, there's a it's, it's kind of a pressure in terms of the, the um, environment and flying and all that kind of thing. I get so much pleasure out fishing kind of locally, as it were, that um, it's a bit of a boring answer, but, you know, I, I could spend the rest of my, my days working my way around Scotland and Ireland, definitely. It's not that boring. I, I guessed you were going to say something along those sorts of lines and staying local. And, and that's been an interesting thing, hasn't it, from lockdown, that I get the sense that people, you know, will get this, I want to travel, I want to go there. But I wonder if it has made people realise what they have on their doorstep. And I've always felt that about Devon. I'm hugely passionate about the trout there and the trout are surprising if you know where to look um and it has pretty much everything i need and i think probably last year and the year before i barely fished anywhere else i didn't need to and it ticked those boxes and also along with that appreciation of what's in the, your backyard a simplicity to fishing that seems to be a trend that continually comes through to me that people are um, carrying less stuff i'm um, fishing a bamboo rod or a glass rod or i don't need this or i don't need that do you sense that too yeah yeah i definitely think so yeah and i think lockdown's just done that generally in life hasn't it i mean we've had to simplify we've had to take pleasure in in you know i mean toast rye bread toast and marmalade or like first cup of tea of the day you know i think once you've adjusted your expectation you can get just as much pleasure out of those things than, you know, the kind of, you get so wrapped up. I mean, I'm thinking about going back to kind of commuting down to my office in town and and you come back and then, you know, you may be out three or four nights a week and, it, you know, it just doesn't stop. It keeps going. And actually it's one of the kind of, you know, obviously the pandemic has been awful, but one of the kind of silver linings for me is that life's just become so much simpler. And I think it's, um, whether it's fishing or just life in general, I think that's that's not a bad thing, definitely. Yeah, cool. Cool. Well, we've chatted, John, for over an hour now, and it's been fantastic catching up as it always is. I know we were only on the phone the other day, but um, it's been lovely to get an insight um, from a team member of the, the magazine, but also your fishing history and your passions and i hope that comes across it certainly comes across in the magazine as well um but i hope it's, it's of interest to our listeners to get a sense of the passion and love for fishing from the people behind the magazine that they put out and like you know whether it is the term passion project or not i don't know that it is it's something i felt i had to do and i enjoy doing it um, but it's been lovely to talk with you as we often do about the magazine and 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 get your insight into it. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. Oh, no worries. Thank you, Pete. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure I'll be on the phone to you soon anyway to bother you about something or other <laughs> before too long. But thanks so much for taking the time. Everyone, this has been the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one too. And there are plenty more in the pipeline. We put these out on YouTube now as well. So if you'd like to watch John and I chatting away, you can do that. And if you enjoy it as well, perhaps you'd consider subscribing as well. But thanks everyone for listening. And there'll be plenty more from the Fly Culture Podcast very, very soon. Thank you.